define uh, uh, definable situations in which credit markets either freeze or um, um, uh, issuance and volume activity um, are very low. And we're going to talk today a lot about liquidity. And usually when you think about liquidity in financial markets, you think about the field of market microstructure, which is actually about the quantum uh, mechanics of financial markets. Uh, we are not going to go to that direction. Uh, we are going to talk about liquidity that is uh, induced or uh, uh, present because of the security design um, of, uh, of debt contracts. So what are credit market freezes? As a very um, broad definition, we refer to large declines in the volume of transactions in both primary and secondary credit markets that occur over a non-trivial period of time. What comes to mind is the most recent financial crisis when we see uh, um, many uh, parts of the credit markets comes to a complete uh, halt and we see liquidity dries up. But by no means this is a, a recent phenomena. Uh, we, we will show you evidence on other financial crises 1873, 1884, 1893, 1907, the Great Depression. These are all uh, times, uh, mostly in, in, in financial crises, that credit markets stop. So what do we do? First, we provide evidence on uh, credit market freezes. We will provide evidence on uh, issuance in pri primary markets, what we usually refer to as funding liquidity. And we will do a more uh, in-depth analysis of uh, market liquidity, which is what happens to trading in credit markets, mostly during the most recent financial crisis. Once we show you the, the evidence, we would like to have some sort of an inter interpretation of what seems to be driving credit market freezes. And we are going to compare two main theories. One of them is asymmetric information and adverse selection, and the other one is heterogeneous beliefs. Um, so let, let me start with the first theory, the asymmetric information and adverse selection theory of liquidity. It's a security design approach to that liquidity. It argues that liquidity um, of, uh, in credit markets is driven by the payoff structure of, uh, of debt contracts. Um, influential paper by Peter DiMarzo that uh, writes an optimal contract for uh, pooling and tranching or asset-backed securities. And more recently, papers by, uh, by Bent and Dan Gorton uh, and bank that look into liquidity in credit markets. The underlying intuition is the same intuition that you have for li liquidity with asymmetric information. You need to have symmetric information about uh, payoffs uh, to have liquidity. Um, and the question is how do you achieve such symmetric uh, information in credit markets? And the main intuition that comes from the models uh, by uh, Dan Gorton and Holmstrom is that when you have debt that is sufficiently over collateralized or that the debt value is high enough, even if you have asymmetric information for a large range of the potential value of the debt contract, there are no implications to value. Uh, this is all coming from the very simple payoff structure of debt contracts. And as you can see here to the right, on the, uh, to the right of the kink, um, the debt is safe. And even if we have differences of opinions about the payoff, there are no implications for, for value. When the debt is not safe, when the firm is in default to the left of the kink, this is where asymmetric information can have consequences for value. They use the term of information in sensitive region to the, uh, uh, um, uh, to, to, to the part of the line or the payoff that is to the right of the kink and information sensitive uh, to the left of the kink. Uh, so this is uh, a model that uh, you can view this as being uh, another way to look into Myers and Mashloof, but from the other side uh, with implication to uh, liquidity. What comes from this model is a very crisp prediction about the relationship between liquidity and prices, which means that I'm going to use very loosely the term value of collateral or value of the bond, but actually it tells us when the value of the bond is high, it's going to be liquid because that we have thematic information. We don't care about other selection. When the value of the bond declines, when it's to the left of the king, then it becomes less liquid. Um, in many ways, and we, we see it in the analysis that, we, uh, that I'll show you later on, that flips the way that we think about liquidity to some, some extent. Many years, people who uh, did research on liquidity had to convince people in asset pricing that you have to price liquidity, so you have to run regression of price on liquidity. And I guess that they don't like what we say is that we actually have to run regressions of liquidity on price. Now, of course, liquidity is price, but liquidity is also determined by price. And that's what we view as being one of the main predictions uh, of this uh, theory. The alternative theory, or one alternative theory, it's not the alternative theory, is one of heterogeneous beliefs. How do you avoid the no trade uh, uh, result or the no trade theorem when you have to assume that uh, participants in market have differences of opinion, some are optimists, some are pe pessimists, and to the extent that market participants are certain 
uh, in their assessment of the of the uh, state of the world or the, the value of the the value of the of the collateral, the value of the bond, then you can achieve trade. This here you also have very crisp prediction, which is when you have more liquidity, when you have more heterogeneity of belief. Um, so this is what we do, and this is what we take into the data. But before we move to a thorough analysis of the secondary market liquidity, I want to we want to show you some evidence on credit market freezes throughout history. And here I'm going to refer to the primary market or cases in which issuance of security seems to rise up. You know, so you probably have seen a version of that uh, before. This is the uh, issuance of um, non-agency mortgage-backed securities or private label uh, mortgage-backed securities. And this is a market that was very active before the crisis and then it stops. Um, it's not only that the mortgage-backed securities market stops, it's also asset-backed securities that are not uh, directly related to, um, to the mortgage market stopped as well. Uh, interestingly, you also see a significant decline in the, in the issuance of corporate bonds. These are plain vanilla corporate bonds issued by regular firms that are not connected directly to the financial sector. We see a decline of issuance there as well. And as I said before, this is not a recent phenomena. There was a, a, a massive crisis, one of the largest financial crises uh, in history in 1873, which was followed by a deep recession, according to the NBR, uh, um, a, a cycle dating its second only to the Great Depression. Um, we see decline of issuance there. Uh, you look into the Great Depression and the bond market, the, this is industrial bonds, uh, disappears for a few years. You know, this is uh, uh, taken from a paper that I've written with Dimitris Papa Nicolau and, and uh, Carola Friedman showing that uh, financial factors were important determinants of employment in, uh, in the Great Depression. And actually, the counterpart of the mortgage-backed securities, these are the real estate bonds of the roaring 1920s, similar to um, mortgage-backed securities, but different, similar because uh, they are backed by individual properties, different because uh, there was no pooling and crunching. Um, and this is the way that most of the, um, uh, build, uh, uh, most of the construction of the building of uh, skyscrapers in New York, in Chicago was funded and the market disappears in the Great Depression. So the question is, why do markets disappear? The results that we show you uh, show substantial declines in bond issuance during and after the onset of the crisis. It is consistent with um, liquidity dries up during downturns in the spirit of Myers and Mashloof, or a more dynamic version of that as in uh, Lucas and McDonald. However, you know, when you look into primary market, you cannot rule out that reduction in issuance is driven by lack of corporate demand stemming from lack of investment opportunities. So we would like to go more deeply into secondary market and see what we can say over there. Let's start with the uh, model of liquidity and asymmetric information. The main prediction of the asymmetric information and other selection theory is that when bond value deteriorates, um, you enter the information sensitive uh, region and liquidity declines. As the first cut into the data, we look into some time series evidence. We start with the financial crisis of 1873, for which we have collected information on all bonds that were trading. This is weekly observation for every bond with bid and ask spreads. What do you see here? Look into the red line. The red line shows you that there was a crisis. This is a, a, a portfolio, weight, a weighted average portfolio of prices of bonds, and you see the sharp decline in prices, and the decline also persists. Uh, you have to find a measure for liquidity of the bond market in the 1870s, and we went with bid ask spreads. So the blue line shows you bid ask spreads uh, in the 1870s uh, for every bond, but we aggregate it up. We normalize it by the mid-price, don't want to get into the technical de details, but very clearly you see that uh, we have this negative correlation between, between uh, prices and illiquidity. Um, now this is the uh, financial crisis of 1873, but you will see a very similar phenomena when you look into the most recent financial crisis of 0709. What do you see here? The blue, uh, the blue line is the uh, price of bonds. These are corporate bonds, plain vanilla bonds, nothing exotic, no asset-backed securities. And following Lehman, you can see there was a sharp drop of more than 10% in prices of bonds that persisted for a couple of months. The red line is a measure of illiquidity. Don't want to get into the technical details. We use three different, uh, in another paper, we use three different definitions of uh, liquidity or illiquidity they all show the same picture. So this is a measure of illiquidity. It's based on the gamma measure that was uh, developed by Bao, Pan, and Wang, which basically follows on the Roll 84 notion of uh, liquidity. You see very clearly here that prices and illiquidity um, are negatively correlated. Um, so um, 
The question is, what do you do? You know, we move to running regressions. These are regressions that are controversial because if you run liquidity on price rather than price on liquidity, we lag prices by one month. Observation here are at a monthly level. That doesn't solve the problem because that the lag price may contain information about future liquidity. So I know that this is macro conference, so you don't worry about endogeneity. But, um, <laughs> but uh, we have another paper. Um, I, I want to refer you to our paper, Debt Information and Inequality, in which we do a thorough analysis of, um, of um, shocking the prices with exogenous of shocks and trying to find and, and, and trying to see how moving price with shocks that are exogenous to uh, uh, illiquidity are affecting illiquidity. And we find significant results for that. We do uh, a battery of tests that establish, um, uh, in our opinion, the causal relationship between prices and liquidity. We don't do it here. Um, what do we find? Um, we find that, um, as you saw from the graphs, that when you run a, a measure of illiquidity, whether it's the gamma measure in the first two columns for um, the 0709 crisis, or it's the bid ask spread um, for the 1873 crisis, there is this negative relationship between uh, price and illiquidity. The negative relation between price and illiquidity survives uh, when you control for a bond fixed effect, you control for year by month fixed effect. Again, this by all means is a causal relationship, but in our other paper, which is much more micro-oriented, we do everything that we can to show that this relationship is indeed causal. Um, okay, so that's, it seems as if there is some merit to the argument that uh, the debt payoff structure of, uh, of, um, of uh, the payoff structure of the de uh, debt contract uh, seems to be an important determinant of, uh, of liquidity. Um, and um, uh, we now move to an alternative theory, which is the theory of heterogeneous beliefs. You know, remember, you have to have a measure of heterogeneous beliefs at the security uh, level. And then if you have more uh, heterogeneity in beliefs, you would expect to see, um, to see more liquidity. Not easy to measure heterogeneity of beliefs. We use two off-the-shelf measures. One of them pertains to the disagreement between S&P and Moody's about the underlying rating of the security. The other one pertains to the dispersion of analyst forecast. None of them are perfect. Analyst forecast of the uh, uh, um, uh, stock that, uh, of the firm that issued the bond. Uh, none of them is perfect. Each one of them might be measuring different things. Both of them have been used in the literature to measure differences of opinions. Um, so we start with some sort of a macro, more macro aggregate look into that. And when you look into the data, it seems that, if anything, differences of opinions have only increased during the crisis. They, they definitely didn't decrease, whether you look into uh, analyst forecast dispersion or into uh, um, the credit rating disagreement. At the security level, on the horizontal axis, we have the degree of disagreement um, between S&P and uh, Moody's. So zero, they agree, and, four, and as you move to the right, they disagree more. On the vertical axis, you have inequality. If anything, it seems as if securities for which there is more disagreement are less liquid, uh, the opposite of the prediction. This is uh, on the horizontal axis, you have a measure of analyst dispersion, more dispersion to the right, less dispersion to the left. If anything, if you have more uh, dispersion, um, securities become more illiquid, uh, which is the opposite of the prediction. Then we uh, put it into a regression, illiquidity on dispersion. And uh, the results that we get are either that there is no relationship or that the relationship goes the other way around, which means more dispersion, less liquidity. This is with um, bond rating differences. This is with uh, analyst forecast uh, dispersion. Uh, then we try to run some sort of uh, uh, a, a, a horse race between prices and measures of, um, of differences of opinions. Uh, and we find that either differences of opinions are no longer related to illiquidity or again, they go in the uh, wrong way, price effect is always there. The question is whether the price contains some information about, uh, about um, uh, belief dispersion. If anything, we find that price has a negative relationship with uh, belief dispersion, which again, even if price is capturing to some extent belief dispersion, it goes the other way of what the theory would predict. And here we show you uh, a regression in which we have a nonlinear structure of four, or four different uh, bins for the rating uh, dispersion and price, and if anything, they show that, um, that uh, um, when you control well with, uh, with the bond fixed effect, the results goes away. When we look into analyst uh, dispersion, it's the same story. Price is always uh, um, negatively related to liquidity, measures of dispersion, which we, we might not be capturing dispersion the way that the theorists have thought about dispersion, but we use the measures of dispersion that exist. These measures have been used in studies 
of uh, linking heterogeneous beliefs to stock returns in the past, or they have been used before. Um, uh, in, in the case of liquidity, um, they don't seem to uh, have much bearing on, uh, on, on, on explaining liquidity. So the next, next question is, you know, we are, not, we are not here to declare that the theory of heterogeneous beliefs in explaining trade and liquidity is dead. We only say that it doesn't seem to explain the liquidity of the bond market in the 08, 09 financial crisis. Um, but the question is how much of illiquidity can we actually explain just with mere prices, with the algorithm selection uh, version of the story. And to do that, what we do is to estimate a regression model of um, um, illiquidity on a nonlinear uh, uh, um, um, uh, structure of, uh, of uh, bond prices, and then use the regression models to predict liquidity for each of the bonds, and then aggregate it up and see how much of the illiquidity can be explained with the decline in prices. Um, so first, you know, why are we doing that? Because as you saw before, there was a major shift uh, in prices of bonds in the crisis. You see here that the, the curves on the right shows you the prices before Lehman, curve on this is a, a CDS, the curve on uh, the green curve shows you what happens immediately after Lehman, and then over time it goes back. So there was a shift in prices. You can also see it if you look into the probability density functions how prices um, 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 uh, go, moves, move to the left, uh, prices, uh, prices go down. So we use this shock in prices or this change in prices to see what happened to, uh, uh, can we predict uh, illiquidity? And here's what we get. Before the crisis, um, we can do uh, an okay job up to 08 in explaining liquidity, the same holds uh, from 2010 and, and onward. In the crisis, depending on the specific specification of the regression, we can explain between 25% and 30% of the inequality uh, with just prices. You know, there's a large uh, fraction that remains un unexplained, but still you can explain about 30% of the variation uh, with the declining prices. Um, so this is, uh, you know, these are, these, are our, these are our main results. And then we move into discuss some uh, potential policy implications. The policy implications stem mostly from our work on credit traps that, you know, we, we, have, we have written in 2012. And here is the intuition that we have, is if you buy into the model of other selection and information sensitivity of that, and one is interested in monetary theory that is designed to uh, boost lending, the main concern is that if you move uh, not quickly enough, you're going to move when asset values are already deteriorating, asset values are already deteriorating, balance sheets are weak, then even if you are going to inject liquidity into the financial sector, the financial sector is going to be reluctant to issue to the real sector, given that the real sector is now in the information sensitive region. So one idea here is that, of course, if you want to move, you have to move before balance sheets are too weak because of weak balance sheets um, moving into the information sensitive, uh, 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 sensitive region are going to make it less likely that the banks would, uh, would lend to firms. I mean, what we have done in the other paper, which we think is relevant here, is that in the interest of increasing uh, asset values or strengthening balance sheets, one can think about fiscal policy that is going to strengthen balance sheets that after the fiscal policy, monetary policy would be more effective because the fiscal policy would make sure that balance sheets are stronger. So we are referring to, to things like uh, reduction in, 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 in tax rates, uh, et cetera. Um, so this is what we have. You know, the conclusion that we would like uh, to draw is that the data is consistent with an information sensitivity theory of liquidity as in Dan Gorton and Holmstrom. We have, here we do it in the context of the financial crisis. Um, outside of uh, crises, we have done a thorough analysis of 10 years of uh, liquidity uh, and prices for the bond market in our other paper, in which we have done everything that we could, both with cross-sectional tests as well as with IVs, to convince, uh, um, convince the readers that uh, um, indeed uh, illiquidity should be priced, but also illiquidity is affected by prices. Uh, between a quarter and, or and a third of the increase in bond illiquidity after the collapse of Lehman can be explained by merely the fact that bond prices have declined. And, you know, with the caveat that our measure, are, our results are as good, our conclusion are as good as the measures, we find little support for the hypothesis that opinion dispersion explains liquidity, illiquidity in the financial crisis of 08 and 09. 